Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. We begin with not just one, but with two great visions of the end, one from the wisdom of Solomon, the other from the revelation to John. And how appropriate it is on this evening of new beginnings that we begin with the end in mind. Now, many of you might recognize that phrase. If you're of my generation, it's likely that at some point you will have read or at least heard of Stephen Covey's influential book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in that book, you'll find it there. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Beginnings and endings are intimately related. We get a glimpse of that in our reading from the Revelation to John. John has written down for us the great vision that God gave him of the end of time. But if you listen closely, you can hear in that revelation that we're being transported not just to the end, but also to the beginning. The echoes of Genesis reverberate in what we just heard. Revelation says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In John's vision, there is a river of the water of life, which flows from the throne of God. In Genesis, God causes a river to flow out of Eden, a river which rises from the earth and waters the ground, giving the first life. The tree of life, which is found in the middle of the Garden of Eden, can be found once more in the holy city of the New Jerusalem. And John's vision of the end declares, look, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. Can you hear the echoes from Genesis? They heard the sound of God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. Now, if you've heard those echoes, you're not the first. We're not the first to notice how the vision at the end, the vision of the end in Revelation takes us back to the beginning in Genesis. T.S. Eliot, for one, the great Anglican poet of the 20th century, alludes to this echo in the famous final section of the last of his four quartets, Little Gidding. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning, the end is where we start from. Begin with the end in mind. The end is where we start from. I'm very pleased to have been invited, have been invited this evening to celebrate this time of new beginnings with St. Matthew's and with Gregor. Gregor is a dear friend. For three years, we did our seminary together at St. Paul University. We took virtually all the same courses. We spent Monday to Friday together virtually every day. On weekends, we did retreats together. In the summer, we did clinical pastoral education together. We were ordained on the same day, eight years ago. We now live in the same neighborhood. I know a thing or two about Gregor. The vast majority of what I know about Gregor, I cannot share with you here this evening. <laughs> Though if any of you would like to buy me a drink at the local pub afterwards, we can talk. But what I can share is this. You have an excellent priest here at St. Matthew's. Hardworking, committed, faithful. And I, for one, am very excited to see Gregor here with you in the parish of St. Matthew's, and, and I'm looking forward with great anticipation to the mission and the ministry that you will do together. Now, I know from my own experience of beginning in a new parish, and from what others have told me about their own parish beginnings, I know that you'll want to tell Gregor all sorts of things. You'll want to tell him about where you come from as a community. You'll want to tell him about your history and your traditions, You'll show him the way that you do things. You'll give him a list of all your committees and the meeting times. 
And that may all be well and good and even necessary. But even more important than telling Gregor where you've come from is to tell him where you're going, to talk, to dream with him about where it is that you're going. This is a new beginning for you as a church, and the end is where we start from. Begin with the end in mind. Now, I'm well aware that beginning with the end in mind presents more of a challenge than does remembering the past or observing the present. Starting from the end calls us to be visionaries. It calls us to be dreamers, to be explorers. It takes us out of the comfort of present certainties into the brave new world of being led by the Spirit of God. It brings us into the time that the prophet Joel talks about, the time when God promises, I will pour out my spirit on all my flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old shall dream dreams, and your young shall see visions. It's a challenge. I urge you to embrace it. We begin with the end in mind because the visions that God gives us of the end are intended to reach back through time and shape who we are today so that we as a church in our own time might provide a glimpse of that end and a foretaste of where it is that we're going. It is the end that gives us our purpose and our meaning as the body of Christ. So let's look once more at John's vision of the end time. It's not an otherworldly vision. In John's vision, we're not transported to some other realm which we might call heaven. It is in fact the opposite. Heaven is brought to earth. The holy city comes down out of heaven from God. Look, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. And this holy city will have no temple for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. It will have no need even of sun or moon for the glory of God is its light. The servants of God will have such an intimate and complete awareness of the presence of God. They will see God's face, and the Lord God will be their light. And the river that flows through the city, and the tree that grows on either side of the river, will be the river of life, and the tree of life. And they will bear fruit, and they will give healing to all the nations. And God says, I will be your God, and you will be my children, and there is praise, and there is worship, and there is great joy. That's the end. That's where we're heading. We are at a new beginning. So what might it look like to begin with that end in mind? What does it mean to be God's people in our time and place? Can our church be a source of life? That abundant, vibrant life which flows from the river that, God, that has God as its source? Might our churches be communities of healing? Might we be able to offer the world a glimpse of God with us in our midst? Can we live into our vocation as children of God? Can we enjoy moments of intimate awareness of God's presence with us? Might we be a people that has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God is our light? Can our praise and our worship join with that of all the saints throughout the ages and in the age to come? Can we offer a glimpse? Can we offer a taste of all of this? Can we be as T.S. Eliot writes, a community where God is heard, half heard, in the stillness, between two waves of the sea, quick now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. Dreaming these dreams, beginning from this vision of the end, will not offer us an easy, well-marked path upon which to set out. But to quote Eliot again, and perhaps
perhaps his most famous line, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. May God bless you, Gregor, in your new ministry. May God bless this new beginning for the parish of St. Matthew's. Amen.